I'm Judy Murray. Behind every champion is a driving force. Victoria at her best. Wanting to prove people wrong was something that was a very powerful driving force in me. We all got prepared for how to perform, but no one prepared us for what will happen after. Dina Asher-Smith, the best of British. If you can see it, you can believe it, and you can believe that that could be you. We knew that we was a part of something bigger. More glory for Sarah's story. If you don't stop doing this, you may go deaf. It was everybody else that almost had to suffer because of because of what I did. Stunning stuff from Edmonton. Becky, I think you need a sports psychologist. And I was like, why? What's wrong with me? I was a little bit scared when he first talked to us. I knew that there was a massive responsibility. The undisputed lightweight champion of the world. Yeah! It's gonna be an historic second goal. Kelly Hall's for Great Britain. I didn't know about a breakdown, becoming a self-harmer, to being depressed. I had no idea what that meant. If you tell me I can't do something, I will go out of my way to prove you wrong. Tasha, Miss GB. Boxing is a, is a really important sport, and I'm really pleased that women are making their way very successfully in the amateur ranks, uh, and now, of course, professionally. Uh, and, you know, Natasha was in the forefront. When she was selected for the GB squad, I couldn't be more proud. Um, I just couldn't believe it. Her determination and her drive to succeed had actually got her there. Fantastic action. Beautiful backhand, Natasha Jonas. Tasha tries to get a bit of special treatment sometimes, but yeah, no, she comes in, she gets treated exactly the same as all of, all of us, and we all do the same sessions, and we all get the same results because of that. Good body shots going in there. It hasn't been easy for her. You know, there has been a lot of obstacles. Mark Jonas is inside work. Really impressive tonight. If Tasha was boxing for a world title and she was a man, then you know, the purse difference would be massive. So Tasha's purse would be here and Anthony Joshua's purse would be here. History in the making here in the Matram <laughs> Garden. The first world title between two British women ever. Seven knockouts in her nine wins. She can punch and she can punch early. There's no magic switch to think, oh, I can just turn up, turn it on, and it'll happen. It just doesn't. If it doesn't happen in camp, it ain't got to happen on fight night. First female to box for Great Britain in the Olympics, a former footballer, mum to Mila, and I want to hear your story. I want to know where your love of sport came from. So can we kick off by talking about your childhood? Yeah, it was, it was an amazing childhood. Um, grew up in Liverpool in Toxteth just after the riots. You know, there was a lot of um, unemployment. The crime rate was high. and. It was, a, it was a struggle, but it was, for me, it was just home. And, you know, I was in my comfort zone. Um, I come from a massive family. It's well known for where I live that there's two Jonases born every year. <laughs> <laughs> we, a, a lot of us lived in my nan's house. I had two older boy cousins that lived with me. Um, and, yeah, just, just being around them, you kind of get into the things that boys do, you know, riding your bike, you know, playing football, yeah, climbing trees, so wherever they went, they had to take me and I could go. <laughs> so, like, we was always together, we was always playing. And I remember the first time my mum told me the story, first time I ever watched the Olympic Games was the 88 Games in Seoul. Um, and because I love sports, I was just fascinated by all the sports that was going on in this one TV programme. And I said to my mum, Mum, I'm going to be there. And I was only four at the time. And my mum said, oh, whatever, love. I'm like, no, <laughs> mum, you're not listening. I'm going to be there. And she said, well, you better go out and practice. So it took me a little Casey and off I went. And I think it started from there. So you were a real tomboy. And you tried lots of sports when you were young? Every single person in our family, because of my uncle, he's got his own, um, like, karate foundation now. Um, but every single person in our family has done karate. 
my dad was into boxing, so I used to go to the gym to the local gym with my dad. Even though at that time, no females boxed or no females were allowed, I was always the one that was oh, it's Teddy's daughter. She could go in, um, and yeah, it was just anything, any sport, anything where it was competitive and I could win, I'd do it. I'd have a go. But football was your first love. You went a completely different route, ultimately, into, into the boxing. But you excelled at football as well. I was way better at football than my two other boy cousins, but they'd never admit that. At that age, you know, competing against lads, you have to be that little bit better to be kind of accepted. And it was one of them, like, oh, she's the girl, we're going to choose her last. But then by the time, like, a year had come and I'd been playing with competitively with the lads and I'd improved, like, a lot quicker, I started getting selected and you were the best in the school team and you really wanted to be the captain. And your PE teacher said you couldn't be the captain until you started to behave in school. And tell me what that did for you. At the time, we, we just clashed. She was a new PE teacher, she was the head of PE. Um, and I, you know, I was the... Academically, even all throughout school, I'd struggled. And when, by the time I'd gone to senior school, um, you're 11, aren't you, when you go to senior school? I had the reading age of a nine-year-old. I'd moved to a totally different area. I was totally out of my comfort zone. But the one thing that I still loved and still did was sport, and that was my, my salvation to, like, combat the loneliness, to combat that I couldn't do the school work. My escapism was... I was still good at sport, and I was recognised for that. Uh, so I first met Tasha when she was in year nine at school, about 13 years of age. Um, she was a very talented young person at that time, so was involved in all of the sports clubs. Um, but I also taught her uh, PE um, and also was becoming aware of her reputation around school where she wasn't engaging in her lessons. I felt like it was a bit of a threat that she was trying to take away from me because she was wouldn't give me this... Like, the only thing I wanted was to be the captain. So I did end up having to have a conversation with Tasha and explain to her that she couldn't be the captain of the netball team for much longer because of the way that she was around school. Um, she wasn't happy with that, told me that I couldn't not let her be the captain. She'd always been the captain. Um, but I did explain to her that captains have leadership roles and skills that they demonstrate at all times. It hurt me more than any detention ever could because I was so used to being part of a team. And I was thinking, oh, I'm letting everybody down because of the way I act outside. And I thought, no, right, OK, I'm willing to take, her, take it, what she's saying on board. And she was the first person um, that I ever told that I was struggling. We then worked together with other members of staff to get her some additional support. And then as she started to turn things around, we then started to have more of the conversations. Well, let's just see a little bit more progress and then we can get you back to being our captain. When I talked to kids in schools, she was really instrumental in changing my life and that just took one teacher, that one person. I think an interesting or an important factor is that where Tasha lived in Wallasey is predominantly white British. And so I was one of very few black teachers in the Wirral and particularly at her school. So for her to have a black female teacher, I think that also helped that she had somebody to kind of reflect upon my experiences and make that work for her too. So you played for Liverpool ladies, you got a cap for England as a junior in football, and that led to you being offered a soccer scholarship to the States. At the time, I was a kid who I hadn't barely been on holiday. Um, so the opportunity to go and play a sport that I loved and, like, I, I remember before I got offered the um, scholarship, I was in talks with the, the uni and they'd said, oh, yeah, we'll come over and I'm going to watch a game. And I watched the Women's World Cup and there was a lady called Mia Hamm who was, like, the Messi of women's football. And I watched the whole World Cup and I was thinking, well, better than it. She was the first ever woman as well to get a million pound sponsorship deal from Nike. She was, she was like a women's megastar. And I thought, right, if I can get to America, I can, you know, I'll be seen, I'll be on a team. And I, it's because football, well, soccer, as they call it, was massive. They were well better than the, the, the English at the time. I didn't 
go there for the academic side. I came there, I went there to be a sports like an athlete and a sports superstar, as I thought. Um, and then, yeah, I'm playing a game and just one bad tackle. And it was the end. So I stayed in the hospital, I was there overnight. And when I came, when I came out, I knew the doctor was gonna tell me something awful. And he was like, I don't really know how to tell you this, but like, you, you're never gonna play football again. I was like, it's like the whole world came crashing down. It was, it was tough. So when the athlete bit was taken away, I felt like I'd lost my identity. So I decided for that reason to come home. Now, when I came home, I was only the, the I think, the first or second person in my family to go to university. Everyone did set up a big party for me when I left because uh, my nan's like, oh, she's going to be some superstar sports player. And I was like, yeah, nan, I'm going gonna, gonna to make it. And that was like the kind of thing that we had. And like, when I came home and I wasn't, I felt like I let them all down. And I didn't even come back with a degree either. And I just fell into a rut. I was 20. <laughs> I was like, oh, if I was going to be a sports star, I'd already be it by now. And for the first time ever in my whole life, I was like, right, I'm done with sport, I'm done with it. I gained a lot of weight. I lost a lot of confidence. Yeah, it was just a, a, a bad time. And now, you know, as an adult looking back, I think I, I was depressed. And um, it was it was it was just a dark time. There was a lot going on outside of of sport as well. That was just it was all becoming a little bit too much. And then I had seven jobs in one year because now I know that sport was my motivation and drive to do anything. That was the, my whole reason for being, as I seen it at that time. And you know I was fine, you know on Friday skipping out of work. But then I'd just be partying all weekend and whatever, and on the Monday I'd be sick. And there's only so many times at times you can do that before, you know, the boss starts thinking that this is a pattern. So I'd get sacked, and then I'd go to another job, and I'd get sacked from that. What was that like? I mean, how did you get yourself out of that funk? It was a hard place to get out of because, like you say, I'd, I'd, all my life I'd, I'd wanted to fight against the stereotypes of where we were from. And I felt like I was falling into the traps of being exactly like everyone else. Um, and it was tough. There was a couple of close people that to me that had died. There was an incident with my nan's house. Um, and my nan was injured and it was just like, right, I don't want to be infamous. I was trying to be famous. So like, like you've, you've got to pull yourself out of this because so it's, it's got it's not going to get any better it's only going to get worse and instead of it being people that were close to me that'll die it'll be my friends and my family who i'm really like close to so i think the the final straw was the accident in my hands and i just thought right can't continue like this something's got to change My uncle, again, has got a karate gym, has always had a karate gym. I said to him, like, can I have a set of keys and just, you know, go in there and just train myself? There was a woman that used to live over the road because the gym was in a little bit of a rough part of Liverpool and she'd watch me go in and out and um, eventually she'd like, she knocked over and was like, I love, uh, my name's Sylvia. She said, have you ever thought about boxing? I thought to myself, boxing? Who wants to get punched in the face? Shut up. I didn't <laughs> say that today, and I was just like, oh no, you know, well, you know, just happy doing what I'm doing. She was like, no, um, they've just started um, a women's only like fitness night at the local gym. Um, I think you should come along. I was a senior coach at the Rotunda, and um, I was starting my own female sessions. 
um, as I wanted to introduce women into the world of boxing, which was something we'd never had an opportunity to do, really. What I seen of her, I thought, my, you know, this girl's got talent. But I also felt like she was looking for something, but I don't think she knew what it was. Just to shut this woman up, I'm going to go to this boxing session. So then the next time she asks me, I can say, you know what, I didn't like her, I'm not going back. She didn't turn up for the first time. And then I saw her again and she didn't turn up for the second time. And there was quite a few times where I'd said, listen, if you want to come, that's fine. And if you don't like it, that's fine as well. But I really do think you've got something. And I didn't want to give up on it. So eventually, she did come down to the rotunda and from then on, there was no turning back. It was tough. And I remember waking up the next day and every part of my body was sore. But I thought, you know what? The first time in a very long time, I pushed myself there. I kind of enjoyed it on the slide. So I'm going to go back and see what, if, I, if I like her again next time. So I kept on going back, kept on going back, kept on going back. Eventually, she was like, you know what? I think you're good enough to be able to box. And all my life, all I've ever done is took me opportunities when they've come. That was how I started, and that was 15 years ago. That's <laughs> Never amazing. It, it is quite intimidating walking into any gym for the first time, whether that's, you know, your local gym or, like, a, a boxing gym. But when once you're in there, you are you become part of a family, and quickly I became part of, like, a different group. And it didn't matter about my age, didn't matter what colour I was, didn't matter that I couldn't box, didn't, none of that mattered, because we were just a, a group of women trying our best doing stuff that she told us to do. So we started off at first, you know, just generally coming to the sessions. And then as the footwork was improving, as the punching and everything got better, and then the sparring did come into it, because we had to, to uh, Tash had to spar with the likes of the Smiths and Bellew and stuff to bring it on. Tasha does a lot of the same sessions as we do and doesn't really get any special treatment. In terms of the fighting, I don't know, I think the women are a little bit more... It is a sport, whereas the men take it a bit personal and I think once they're in there, the, the will to win is just the same as the men. How different is the football environment in terms of the training, the fixtures, the support to the boxing environment that you then went into? We've got to remember when I was playing football, it was a very, very long time ago. So there wasn't that much of a structure there. You know, there was very few girls that played. Um, it wasn't as hard as it is now to get into a team like that. But the thing I thought I loved about football was the team aspect of it. I loved being part of a team and, you know, um, but what used to frustrate me within that was that I'm, I'm a player who I believe always gave 100%. And I have been known to take off my own boots and throw it at my own players because I'm so frustrated that they're not trying as hard as I am. But in boxing, it's all about you. I'm, I'm not relying on anybody to drag anybody else through. It's just about me. But when we first started in boxing to, you know, we were so far behind other countries. You'd be boxing the same person every year to win the national title because there was just that little of a pool. Because to get somebody to spar with the same weight, experience and age was almost impossible because it was so new to the world of boxing. We had to go outside to Manchester and further afield just to get Natasha a decent spar. The boxing started a long time after the football did, but it was like the same again, starting again. It hasn't been easy for her. You know, there has been a lot of obstacles being a female in the boxing world. You know, I don't know how many people probably thought it'd just be a, a passing phase. Boxing at that stage was so far behind at the, the, the men's sport. You know, Jane Couch herself had to even take the boxing board of control to, to, legal, to, to the legal procedures to be even be counted as an athlete and be able to legally box in, in, in the UK. I used to box on unlicensed shows and box abroad on legal shows where women's boxing was legal. Um, so right up to that point, I was then offered a fight at Wembley Stadium and I wasn't allowed to take it because it was illegal 
to box in this country, even though I was world champ, two times world champion and boxed in other countries all around the world. She went to court to get boxing accepted as a sport that women could do. Court case was against the British Boxing Board of Control, so that was for her professional boxing. Sarah Leslie, the solicitor, saw saw me do an interview about it, that I couldn't box in my own country as a current world champion. And it was then that got in touch and we decided to take the case. There was no amateur scene. But then when Jane Couch became professional, then young girls wanted to start boxing. Even letting the girls into the clubs later on after I paved the way for it, it was still very difficult for the girls. So Tasha and Savannah and a lot of the girls was still finding it hard. I was playing football at the time, and I remember the whole Jane Couch court case. And little did I know how that would affect me later on in life. When she'd won it, I thought, good on you, well done. Good on you. And then it was years later that I actually started boxing. It was like 10 years later. As Tash and the girls were just getting into it, they were finding a lot of what I'd just been through. and. And that's wrong, you know? It'll get better for future generations because of people like Tash and myself and, you know, but it's not, it's still not where it should be even today. We came shortly after that where it was still in its prime. There was still lots of negativity about it. The same as with football when we started that. It was like, in that sense, it wasn't dissimilar. There was, there was lots of things that were the same, you know? We weren't treated equal. We didn't have the same kit as the boat lads. In G when we were, went on to England boxing, we had two vests. We had a, a, a large and a small. So we had one small top for the rest of the six other girls that were boxing. So you just pray that you weren't the last on that day because it would have six other people's sweat on it. You used to have to go and wash it under the, the sink with a bit of soap and then like hang it on the... I can't believe this. <laughs> but people think like, that's what happened, that's the way it was. And now we look back and laugh to say, that's what we had to go through to get it where it was. But I'm so glad that young girls now don't have to do that. But that gives us a little bit of a toughness that I don't think some of the young girls will ever have to experience. And not that that's a negative thing, because I would hate for that to still be the same place all this time on. I like a mindset that women didn't do that, that wasn't a woman thing to do and nobody wants to see it. And it took a long time for them kind of that older generation or that mindset to go. And we didn't even really break down that until the Olympics came. And it was only when people seen women's boxing at its elite level that they thought, actually, these girls can box. And then other young girls were saying, well, that's an Olympic sport. I could get there and that. And then they were saying, ah, they had someone to look at and be like, She's a female doing that sport, I can do that as well. Elbows down, 11 o'clock. Hands, head nice and low and hands high, okay? Start in a good position, finish it in a good position. So you're in the rotunda, you've gone through the exercise classes, you move into the novice division of boxing, and Sylvia is still the coach at that point. They generally tended to be a bit younger. Um, so it was quickly apparent that I was too old and too strong for these young kids. So then I had to be moved into the, 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 the like kind of elite class, which was with the head coach, which was Mick McAllister. In my coaching days, I give you 100%. I give you more than 100%. So for me, a little bit wasn't enough, and I had to leave the game. Then Mick became the role I once was. What was the difference for you of then having 
a male boxing coach as opposed to having Sylvia? So, <laughs> the main difference is that I couldn't get away with nothing. The Rotunda it was the first place that I ever went to boxing, but it was also the first place that didn't see me as a female, didn't see I was just a boxer. I'd kind of, with Sylvia, got away with the whole, oh, well, they're lads, so they can do more and they can run faster and they can, you know, get up this. We used to do these hills, that were a nightmare. When I look back, that, that developed me into the boxer that I, that I am now. I love it. And how long did it take till you had your first proper boxing match? I think it was six months. I had my first proper boxing match and it was a home club show. As I said, there wasn't many, very many women at the time. Um, so the girl that I ended up boxing was someone who had sparred um, on my journey. Like, the first bout was against Anastasia. It was at the Adelphi Hotel, and it was a first win. A first win of many, I have to say. It was consecutive as well. From working with Mick, how long was it until you started to represent England at boxing? <laughs> Within a year, I'd won the, um, the ABAs, um, which basically means you're the champion of England. Once you're the champion of England, you start, you know, training with England and trying to be the person selected to go to tournaments for England. Um, so that happened all within a year. When you became part of the England setup, what opportunities did that open up for you? Were they training opportunities or competitive opportunities or both? It was a little bit of both. Um, obviously, when you're representing England, then you were funded to go to some of the bigger tournaments. So you could go to the European unions, you could go to the Europeans, you could go to the world. Um, and if you were going to them competitions, that meant that you had to have training camps in order to go. So how do you manage to balance all of that with working as well and funding yourself? You couldn't. It was virtually impossible. There was talks of the Olympics and female boxing was going to be accepted in the Olympics and there was a, a program um, that Liverpool City Council ran that um, basically you could get a council job funded by the council that could work around your you training. So in 2009 was announced, that's when it was announced that boxing was going to be part of the Olympics in 2012. We was on a training camp in Sweden at the time and we had a lot of the Swedish press around us and all us as team, you know, England and Sweden were all huddled around the telly waiting for Dr Wu to say whether it was or it wasn't. I'll never forget it, we were all sitting there, there was like one little telly in, in like a dorm in, the, in Sweden in their like national training centre. We were all like, oh, what's going to happen? And they said, and it's in, and we were like, hey. And obviously all the Swedish press were there, so they were taking all, they, they'd made a fuss of us. Um, and yeah, we, we knew then that something mega was about to happen, and it did. Uh, I was always in favour of women being allowed to box um, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it is a fabulous discipline, and I really do believe that. Uh, secondly, 90% of the people that join boxing clubs actually don't go into the ring competitively, but the, the boxing training is, is that, that they undertake is fantastic and is, is full of discipline and focus, which is what you want young people to be doing. So 21 years or so after you'd watched the television and told mum, Esther, I want to do that, I'm going to be that, you could see it. it. It was a game changer, wasn't it, for for you? There was always something that kept me in boxing. Like, um, when I boxed for the Rotunda, I was just happy to have, I know, a Rotunda. It was like a prestigious club and, you know, everybody kn knows who the Rotunda is and I was happy to have a Rotunda top and box for them and won. And then they were like, oh, you can go into the ABAs if you want. And I was like, okay. And then they said, it was going to be in the Olympics and it was about to be an Olympic sport and had to be funded and had to, they had to make a Team GB. So all these athletes and boxers from 
you know, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England had to all come together and they were only going to be places for nine funded athletes. But within that, only one person from each weight would get to go to the qualifier and actually qualify. They were knocking themselves sick. They were making themselves ill because they were desperate to box in the Olympics. It was a proper doggy dog world. Tasha herself, she's had to come down the weight to box the weight she had to in the Olympics. I'm competing against three other women in my weight division, trying to be the one person selected to go to the one qualifier. After I thought England, the England vest was as good as it was going to get, now there was Team GB, and I was like, and then you could be in the Olympics, but you had to get the Team GB vest first. We got on the programme, and I was one of the, the, the I think, eight initial people selected. What big differences did getting on that team make to your home life and your boxing life in terms of the additional support that that brought? We were basically paid to train. We, we now had the best coaches in the country and structure open to us that we'd never had access to before. We had our own kit. We had a kit in abundance. Did you feel that you found your identity again? You know, everything that you said you felt you'd lost after you got the injury when you were on the soccer scholarship and suddenly you're back, you're part of a team, you're aiming towards something. Did you find that that brought you back to what you always wanted to achieve? Yeah, I found, I found a new family. Even though the, the females that I was competing with were, were all competing for the one spot, these are girls that I was with for two years lived, like, literally in the same place as each other. You can't help but be close to them. Is there a bit of rivalry in there, or are you generally very supportive of each other? Of course there's rivalry. You're trying to be the one person selected to go to that one qualifier. Not everybody had the same dynamics um, as me and Amanda Coulson, but me and Amanda grew really close, even though we was the biggest rivalries within the team. Sounds like you recognise the importance of each, having each other to spar with. It's that whole women supporting women thing that is so incredibly important at all levels of sport. Yeah, it was women supporting women, but we, we knew that we was a part of something bigger and we, we wanted to, you know, set the tone for the rest. And there was some things that were going on that way and when, how, how we envisioned it. And we had a, between us, and we never ever spoke a word about it, but we had a common, like, courtesy of this is how we're going to set respect, the standard. Respect, probably. Yeah. Respect for what each other is doing. Yeah, we're going to set the standards for the rest of the girls and to be like, yeah, that's the way that it should be. So what was it like preparing for the Olympics as you got closer to competing in your first round? We'd just gone to China for the World Championships. Now, we only, in the 2012 Olympics, we only had one qualifier. There was more participants than ever before because you know, it was the first time women's boxing was going to be included. There was only three weight divisions compared to the men's 10. And it made it tougher. And, you know, there's Katie Taylor, who's a, it was like, you know, she was the phenomenon in female boxing at the time, pound for pound, greatest ever. But then I qualified. I was on like a different cloud. I, mentally, I was in a different space because now that had to, the, the world championships for me had solidified. I was better than I thought I was and the mindset that got me qualified for the World Championships was going to be the mindset that got me to the Olympics. What was it like going into your first match at the Olympics after everything that you've gone through? Every time that there was a GB athlete, you know, we had 10,000 people in the XL Arena and the noise was deafening and 99% of the crowd was for you. So that was just crazy in itself. So, you know, there was, boxing's the only sport that lasts from the first to the last day as well. I'd watched other people go in and the reception they'd got. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, everyone's cheering for us. And I was like, oh, this is unreal. And we were doing well. We hadn't had no one lose. So then it came to my turn and I was like, right, I'm not going to be the first one to lose. You know, like, 
Like, and it was Queen Underwood who was the silver medalist that one stayed. I was like, there's no way she's beating me, there's no way. Uh, so then, obviously, you know, next in the ring, Jonas England, the Great Britain. Ah, the crowd goes mad. I'm like hyped, I'm like, ah. And it gets in the ring and it wins. And it's just the best feeling ever. It made every sacrifice, every time I'd wanted to quit, every time I'd cried, the blood, sweat and tears for that moment, just to step out the ring and hug everyone and be like, well, then, like, it made it all worth it. Yeah, all were all worthwhile. So not only were you the first female to box in an Olympics, you were the first female to win a boxing match in the Olympics, and you were part of the loudest crowd noise recorded at those Olympics. Yeah. So how did that all make you feel? It was mad because I didn't come out with an Olympic medal, but I came out with an Olympic record. You won. You, you won. <laughs> you won hearts, yeah, probably. I will come out with an Olympic record, so I'll, like that's me. So after the Olympics, the next major for you was the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow in 2014. And then there was another curveball. Talk me through that. I had no intentions of ever staying for 2020, but I thought, right, I didn't get the, the medal that I really, really wanted in, um, in 2012. So I'm going to make sure there's no way I can't get it in Rio. So I committed myself to another four years. Um, and then the Commonwealth Games in 2014, um, I, I had a, just a freak accident, and a freak fall and landed funny, and I snapped two ligaments in my toe. Um, that meant that I missed the qualifiers for Rio, and that was the end of my amateur boxing career. At what point, after having Mila, did you decide that you were going to go back into boxing and try for a professional career? Once I'd shut the door on the amateur boxing, I, that was me done with boxing. Never thought, there wasn't really a professional scene here. Never thought about it either. Um, I'd committed to, that was me done with sport. And Mila was, I think about 18 months old. And Katie Taylor, just after Rio, Katie Taylor signed with Eddie Hearn and was, you know, doing a professional debut. So Sky had said, would you like to come along and do some commentary work for us? And I'd said, yeah, I'll come and do it. So I was there speaking about Katie. Um, and then the next day, our uh, Team GB captain, Tom Stalker, called me and was like, oh, I seen you doing the commentary. That was brilliant. He said, I can't believe it. Women's boxing's going to be going to be flying now. Like, wouldn't you ever think about doing it? The next day, I was like, actually, what is stopping me? So Tom Stalker lit the fire again. He lit it in a big way. Um, but before, I, I'd i already half made up my mind, but I didn't know whether it was me just, like, fantasising about unfinished business or, or whether it was actually something that was realistic. So the first two people I went to go and see was my mum and my cousin, because they see the side of boxing when it doesn't go right. I feel sick whenever I watch Andy and Jamie playing tennis matches, and I can't imagine what it's like watching somebody knocking lumps out of your child. For me, it's not a going into the ring and no, that's going to be my gap. Punch might get hit, you know, I cut and all that. I think it's just anxiety of the outcome. Um, and I kind of worry about what happens, it sounds awful saying what happens when she, the fight's over. Pam with Tasha, she's very hard at showing emotions. Um, she kind of keeps everything to herself. So, um, and because she's that way, I try not to smother her, because I know she just likes that freedom of taking everything in, absorbing everything, whether it's a, a win or a loss, and then later on she'll open up type of thing. So it's, it's more um, having that balance. They see that side of boxing, they've seen me down, and they've seen how... They've seen the other side and how, like,
like horrible it can be. Um, so I phoned them and I was like, what do you think? She was like, well, we'll support you whatever you do, you know that we, we're, we're always, as long as you're, you've got, you know what you want to do and you're going to do it, we'll be with you. And I was like, I was like, that's all I needed to hear. How did you go about getting back into it? I called Tom back. I was like, what do you need to do? He's like, the first thing you've got to do is find a manager and then the next thing you have to do is find a coach. And when I was thinking in my head of all the coaches that like, I'd put on my little list, Joe was on the list and I, I did already know Joe. And I'd had a good relationship because he was the Smith trainer and I used to go and support the Smiths and watch them box. I was like, Joe's the one that's took people to world championship, you know, level and, and winning. I didn't know at that time what kind of person or what kind of athlete I was going to come back at. So I was like, no, if I'm going to go with anyone, it's going to be Joe. For me, myself at first, when Natasha first approached me about training her, I was like, mm, not too sure about this. I have a daughter and I, I like putting her into karate and self-defense judo, but it's a little bit different starting getting get a little bit punched um, around the ring. He was like, right, let's do a trial. I don't know what like shape you're in. I don't know if I'm going to be for you. I don't know how you're going to work as the team, because even though you're individuals in boxing, you're still part of a team, you've seen the camaraderie in the gym, we're still a team. She was training, we had a trial, and her first spar and, and her nose bled. I was like half panicking, oh Tasha, oh, let me wipe your nose, let me wipe your nose, and uh, just over a matter of time, and uh, I'm not saying Natasha got a, a, a regular nosebleed, so I got used to it, but um, I just think over a time, uh, her skill set more than anything else, her skill set, uh, her attitude, um, you can't knock it, she's just as driven, just as disciplined and just as talented as what um, her counterparts her males are. He was like, come and, um, and let, let's see if you fit in and how well you fit in. So in training camp, I was pushing her buttons all the time to make her snap, to lose control. But then the key was learn how to be in control about being out of control instead of not being out of control and your game's gone to pot and you lose your composure and your tactics and your skill set. It's controlling that emotions. I absolutely loved the feel of punching something. Wait till you punch Joe. <laughs> <laughs> You'll love that. So backhand, jab, backhand, jab, back, forward, jab, backhand. You got it? <laughs> you go. ready? Brilliant. You ready? I've just got to go and get the contracts. Again, <laughs> good. Oh, I like the fact that that last one. Getting warmed up here now, Carla. <laughs> jab, right hand. Jab, right hand. One, two. Good. One, two. Am I right like this, starting yeah. here? Yeah. Hands up. There, jab. Right hand. Roll. Make sure you come under. Yeah. Again. Okay. One, two. Roll. Oh, get in! This is very different from what you were in with the GB squad, where everything's provided for you, but there's no money coming in. It's the difference between the amateur and the professional. What was that like for you going into, or seeing it with business eyes, rather than just the sport eyes? I was fortunate to go with Joe, who, who, knows, who knows what he's doing. He knows the game inside out, and, and not just for the money he can make in his pocket, because it's not about that to him. He wants to win and he wants you to do it well. Now, looking at the two of them um, and the bond he's got with Tasha and also the bond Tasha has with Joe, um, it's just lovely. I, I could see Natasha, she wasn't an athlete that was just getting up and being looking after herself. She had to do a mum role first, do everything, come in, do a training, Mila wants the toilet, Natasha has to stop training, take her daughter to the toilet, little things like that. So you can see the pressure, so you have to be tolerant into that sense. And But you've got to, like you say, understand what Natasha's going through. It was like going to the Rotunda again on the first day. Um, but this time, I'm going into an environment where I was already established. People knew who I was. It wasn't starting from the bottom, and it wasn't as daunting as it was the first time but I still felt that kind of thing that you do as a woman, that I want to prove myself to these men. I want to pr prove that I'm just as good. I want to prove that I deserve to be here. 
women's boxing's really on the up, but what needs to happen now for it to have any chance to fulfil its potential? I think the same as the Olympics, we need visibility. Um, that helps the sport grow in all kinds of, of ways, you know. Um, the on-screen media stuff, that the attention that we get, um, the brand power and, you know, sponsorships with, with big companies and the participation from, you know, the young kids growing up, you know, we need we need it to be out there for, for all to see. We know how good women's boxing is because we're participants. We just need the world to see it. Really pleased that women are making their way very successfully in the amateur ranks uh, and now, of course, professionally. Uh, and, you know, Natasha was in the forefront uh, of that. And I know, again, that so much of her time is spent inspiring youngsters in the Liverpool area. In fact, I think she left the games. The first thought was to get back up to Liverpool, uh, which she was, and she did a round of the schools and, and was very focused on that. You're the, you're the newest, like, newest to the Rotunda. How did you feel? Come, you said that there's loads of lads in the, yeah. in the sessions. How did you feel coming in? At first, I felt a bit awkward, like, I'm the only girl. But obviously, I seen Kira and I was like, oh, I'm not the only one. And then, just as I've been boxing, it's been getting easier and easier, and all the boys are, like, dead supportive. I feel like I belong here now. I was very worried about not being as good as I was. Like, I started smoking for a bit, I stopped boxing for a while, and then, in the end, like, it's just building that courage to get back into it, but it's, like, feeling a bit judged. Don't ever judge yourself from who you were, cos that person's long gone. So start from the person that you walk through the door at and then base yourself off getting better from there. So how long before we see equality in purses and airtime, do you think? I don't want to knock it back because we have come a long way. You speak to Jane Couch, she's someone who sold £20,000 worth of tickets and got paid 800 quid out of that. It's not on a level, level playing field with men, so... If Tash was boxing for a world title and she was a man, then, you know, the purse difference would be massive. So Tash's purse would be here and Anthony Joshua's purse will be here. So there's, there's, there's big changes to be made, but there's only the boxing board of control that can, can do that to make it more fairer. And, and while girls like Tash are banging the drum and encouraging the next generation, we don't want to encourage the next generation to come in to something that they thought it was that it isn't, because once you get to the professional level, the politics are horrendous. You look at, you know, the likes of myself and Katie Taylor. Katie Taylor's on almost seven figures for, for fights, so we have come a long way, but we have still got a long way to go. Unfortunately, I don't think that happens in, in my career time but hopefully we'll break down the doors as we have all the way along and make sure that it's there for the, the females coming behind us. Tash, thank you so much for joining me today. I have absolutely loved listening to your story. It's been an education and an inspiration. It's been an eye-opener into the world of boxing. You are a total driving force. Oh, cheers, thank you.